Hi, I'm John, the Community Currency Interest-Free Currency Engineer Termel, and today I'm going to be reading two articles about how the currency on the island of Guernsey was instituted and the great effects that it had. So, this is an example for all of society that we should all follow. No interest loans may save us. Monday, October 4th, 1993, in the Toronto Sun, an article by Walter Stewart. <coughs> Waterloo. At the risk of introducing a new idea during an election campaign, my abolitionist party was running. I was running for prime minister. Two professors at University of Waterloo want to revive the Canadian economy by using a scheme that has worked on Guernsey. The island, not the cow. The professors are Jack Kersell, who teaches political science, and Robert Needham, an economist and director of the Canadian Studies Program at Waterloo. Their idea is that the government should direct the Bank of Canada to issue credit at low or no interest for building capital projects, roads, schools, hospitals, bridges, railways, airports. Actually, this is what the Bank of Canada did during World War II with great success and despite the wisdom of conventional economics without causing undue inflation. In addition, various levels of government could borrow this newly created money to retire high interest loans. The result, the professors believe, would be a vast improvement in Canada's employment, a sharp drop in the deficit, and a return to stability and prosperity, which I've been promising for 30 years. At a theoretical level, the proposal has some impressive academic backers, including William Henry Pope, co-author of the classic Canadian text, Economics, used in every university in the country, John Hudson of Toronto, founder of Comer, the Committee on Monetary and Economic Reform, where I first presented my Unilets argument in 1985, and economist Alan Schmidt of Michigan State. <clears throat> There's even a lobby group called Sovereignty, which has headquarters in Freeport, Illinois, and which has drawn up a piece of legislation, quote, to create U.S. government credit funds and direct the U.S. Treasury to issue such funds as interest-free loans to state and local governments. Yes! The idea is that central governments should take back from the private banks the crucial role, which they had until recently, of creating money for the economy, thus restoring sovereignty to the state. The theory has been put in practice on the Isle of Guernsey since 1816, with apparently overwhelming success. Didn't make the news, did it? I'm not sure, given the differences between Canada and a small island state in the English Channel, whether this lesson means we ought to copy Guernsey or move there. But the Guernsey experiment's worth a look. In 1816, Guernsey was in a hell of a mess. The sea walls were crumbling, there was no marketplace, roads were muddy and horrible, and the local government was 19,000 pounds in debt. Revenue came to about 3,000 pounds annually, 2,400 of which went to pay interest on the debt. Sounds like us, except that, except unlike us, the Guernsey folks did something about it. They created and lent to the government 6,000 pounds of interest-free money and used it to fix up the sea walls. This worked so well that they went on doing it and are still doing it to create an economy with zero unemployment, a high standard of living, low taxes, and very low inflation. Gasoline, for example, costs about one-third of what it does in England, only 120 clicks away. What worked in Guernsey may not work here, in a much more complex and more exposed economy. Sure it will. Canada has long since lost control of its own economic destiny. We traded it to the U.S. for hamburgers and to the Japanese for VCRs long ago. Just the same, the idea of looking at debt and the way debt is created is a worthwhile one, if only because it'll drive our bankers crazy. The way it works today, almost all of our money supply is created by the banks as interest-bearing debt with them on the receiving end. We can't solve the deficit crisis thus created by slashing expenditures or raising taxes because these measures bring the economy crashing to a halt. The solution then appears to be to substitute low or no interest public funds for high interest public money. The approach can hardly be any more misguided than the pointless lashing around that is all conventional approaches have to offer us today. Okay, the Guernsey experiment, dated October 15, 2008, from thisisguernsey.com. So, the article is, in the second of three articles, Toby Birch, who, under the pseudonym of Hugo Bulo, wrote The Final Crash, Addictive Debt, and the Deformation of the World Economy, recalls a historic tale of triumph in the face of economic turmoil that happened right here 
in Guernsey. As weary troops returned from a protracted foreign war, they encountered a land wracked with debt and rising prices, whose crum crumbling flood defenses were about to be overwhelmed. This was not New Orleans in a new millennium, but the grim reality of life in the bailiwick just after the Napoleonic Wars. As is often the case, victory brought about austere, severe austerity on the home front to contain inflation and deficits, which then, as now, go hand in hand with war, Britain had introduced the gold standard to restrain the money supply and make sure rich people got a lot of interest, didn't lose the value. The unintended consequence, unintended as if they didn't know, was that loans issued over many years to fund the fighting were recalled overnight. Gridlock ensued as labor and materials were abundant, but much-needed projects stalled for want of capital, money. They had lots of material and tools, the real capital, they stalled for lack of money. A period known as poverty among, amidst plenty. With sterling as the common currency, Guernsey suffered similarly. The swamping of Sarnian sea defenses was symptomatic of her overwhelming debt trap, with borrowing costs alone consuming 80% of annual revenues. An already crippling deficit would need to be doubled simply to fix the failing infrastructure. In what proved to be a defining moment for the island's finances, bailiff Daniel de Lille Brock formed a state's committee to defeat the dilemma. The guy's name, we got it, Daniel de Lille Brock. He is still commemorated on our one pound notes, as are the town markets, the first of the experiment's many successes. If the states could fund projects by issuing its own banknotes rather than borrowing from a private bank, there would be no interest to pay, leading to substantial savings. Right? If the government run the money system by themselves instead of letting the private banks do it, they wouldn't have to pay any interest by borrowing, would they? It was an idea favored by Abraham Lincoln some 70 years earlier. No, later. 1816, he was 1860s. To balance the equation, the initial deficit would need to be neutralized at a later date to avoid expanding the money supply too aggressively. Yeah, they're worried about too many chips issued as long as the collateral has been put in. Who cares? This was achieved by adding a sell-by date to the notes, rather like a maturity date on a bond. For example, the note issued on November, 20, uh, on no, November 21st, 1827, promises to pay the bearer one pound on the 1st of October, 1830. To honor this future obligation, a portion of tax revenue and the rent from the resulting infrastructure was set aside to pay off the interest-free borrowing. What started as a trial led to a string of construction projects, such as new roads, sea defenses, public buildings, edifices that still stand and function to this day. Full employment and price stability were achieved without deficits or a penny paid in interest. Money was used in its purest form as a mechanism for oiling the wheels of commerce and development. One would have thought that everyone would have been delighted with such success, but that was not the case. The private banks had been cut out of the equation. No loans meant no interest and no profit. They may have been the source of a mysterious complaint made to England's Privy Council, leading to a self-imposed ceiling on the issue of Guernsey notes for the next century. Mm. This is still relevant today. While stimulus packages and bank bailouts are paraded as solutions to the crisis, they're actually part of its very cause. The quick-fix approach of producing money out of thin air and never paying it off is ultimately self-destructive thanks to an ever-escalating interest bill. Credit generation can be beneficial, but only if the money is later retired in a measured manner. This requires restraint and stewardship, qualities that cannot exist alongside misplaced incentives. Like swords to plowshares, banks still have a role to play in providing liquidity by matching investors with borrowers, but they can no longer be trusted with unfettered credit creation. Apparent prosperity for one generation leads to penury for their offspring through higher inflation and taxation. The Guernsey experiment shows that interest-free finance works wonders, but requires an unselfish philosophy, much like America's founding fathers who wrote the U.S. Constitution with future generations in mind. As the blame game begins, we will no doubt see knee-jerk legislation being implemented by the very people who fomented conditions for the crisis. 
This is not the time for insipid laws, but for inspirational leaders to match the insight of our ancestors. The Guernsey Experiment is the title of a booklet compiled in 1960 by Olive and Jan Grubiak at Omni Publications USA. So, thank you very much from thisisguernsey.com, uh, 15th of October, 2008.